Well, it wouldn't be 2020 if we didn't have the most technical difficulties we've ever had in the history of our church. In 11 years, um, it's, it's actually just in my own, like early days of pastoring, I probably would have been really stressed, and I'm just laughing this morning, just laughing. And you know what I'm laughing at? I'm laughing at the fact that we're still gathered together, and uh, I've been, I worship with believers in Uganda, I worship with believers in Haiti, and we still have so much more as we come to gather together as uh, American consumers to our church this morning. And so we have so much to be grateful for in the gospel. Um, we have been in a series of churchology, as Jamie said, and before we jump back into First Timothy next Sunday, which I'm super excited about getting back into, uh, we wanted to take a moment, take a moment as a church, and just talk about faith and politics, uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. We are 30 days or so away from an election, and you have been bombarded, as I have been, with um, ads and. Uh, used to just be like spam emails and now spam texts from every political party under the sun. They don't even know my name. It's like, David, are you with us this year? Can you come in the road? I don't even know who David is. I mean, I don't need the Lord, but like, I don't know who had this phone before me. Um, every four years, <laughs> like clockwork, we, we enter into this season of great fear and opportunity as Christians. And as Americans, we want to come into this election, and we want to we want to we want to be faithful believers. And that presents us with an opportunity, and it presents us with a great challenge because there is great confusion on what it means to be a believer as it relates to our politics. And you may have noticed that gospel-loving Christians disagree on a range of topics in this arena, like what kind of government most honors God? Or what is the Christian's responsibility to influence the government toward our ideals as believers? What involvement should a Christian have in the political affairs of a country? Should a Christian vote? If so, what principles should govern that decision? We are now just a month away from electing our next president, and these kinds of things are dominating the airways. They're dominating the conversations that we have. And leaders from both sides of the political spectrum want you to believe that this is the most important election this nation has ever faced. And that you can't be a Christian if you vote for and then fill in the blank with the opposite party. And politics have dangerously become litmus tests for orthodoxy. And we are watching it tear at the fabric of not only our country, but even in the church as well. And so we will continue as your elders to compel you to help you think biblically about these things. And, and you, you would expect this from us as we preach. But our hope is that you would treasure Christ in all of life, including politics, so that you can spread the joy of Jesus that comes from that instead of vitriol and anger and division. So let me be upfront with you what this message is going to look like. It's going to be a little bit different this morning. I'm going to root it in the scriptures, although there's not one main text that we're going to only be in this morning as our normal practice of exposition and preaching. My goal this morning is not to argue for who you should vote. My goal this morning is not to argue which party you should vote for. I'm not even going to argue this morning that as a Christian, you must vote. What I want to do is I want us to step back from this election, and I want us to think about a biblical framework of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man, how those two things together, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man, shape the way that we do our lives. If, we're, if we understand the kingdom of God related to the kingdom of man, it will shape us. It will shape our personal decisions regardless of what those look like in this election as a believer. So for those of you who love three-point sermons, this is it. I've got one point and I've got five applications. So I've got one point. You should be able to track with that and go with this, this one. So one point and five applications. I want to pray. Would you join me in prayer? God, I, I believe with my whole heart that those who are yours in this room want to honor you. Want to honor you, Lord. Want to please you. Want to seek your heart. Lord, we want you to govern our thoughts, actions, feelings, and decisions. We want to act in a way that pleases you, God. So give us clarity this morning so that we would know why we act, 
not just one. Help me as I preach, Lord. Let, let whatever is true and biblical come out. And whatever is just my opinion, Lord, be left as a much distant secondary Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I'm just going to give you the main point up front. Here is the main point all that I'm trying to do this world. Here it is. Ready? Here it is. Christ is king. Christ is king. And the Christian's true identity, I'm thinking like political identity, is as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Let me say it again. Christ is king. And the Christian's true identity is as a citizen in the kingdom of of God. So there's a lot of talk these days about transforming the culture, engaging the culture, redeeming the culture. There's a lot of social implications then that, that, that are brought to bear. There's an emphasis on the social aspects of, of even the implications of the gospel. And so politics becomes a very important part then in some of the Christian message. So some will go so far as to see Christian Christianity blending together into a political kind of stance. So to be a Christian is to be a Republican, or to be a Christian is to be a Libertarian, or to be a Christian is to be a Never Trumper, or so on and so on. But Jesus comes to the earth with a very different message. Here is his message that he comes preaching. He comes preaching the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, synonymous. It's used 160 times in the New Testament. I'm just going to read you two of them. Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 4, 42-44 says, And when it was day, he departed and went to a desolate place, and the people saw him and came to him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus' central message in the Gospels is that the kingdom of God has broken into this world in his coming. In his person, the kingdom of God is now at hand. Now, when we think about a kingdom, we normally think about like princes and, and castles and knights. We think about defending a specific region of land. And that's what many people thought Jesus was talking about, which is why the Romans were so concerned, because they didn't want a political uprising to come and, like, and remove their, their power that they had over the Jews, over the occupation that they had of, of Jerusalem. But that's not the kind of kingdom Jesus is talking about. It's a kingdom without geographic borders. It's a kingdom marked by his rule and his reign, which is sung about. His rule and his reign over people's souls, not over their country. It's a relational rule. It's a relational reign. It's a spiritual rule. It's a spiritual reign that transcends all other little kings and all other little kingdoms that are established of this world. Now, I'm going to show you that from John 18. And Jesus says this much as he stands before Pontius Pilate during his trial, and Pontius Pilate is questioning him about his being a king. And Jesus answers him in verse 36. He says, my, this is so key again, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So often, our political elections are cast in terms of a battle, right? They're cast in terms of a battle. We've got to fight. We've got to fight. We need someone who's going to fight for us. If our kingdom is of this world, then that makes sense. Jesus is saying that's the way that the kingdoms of the world operate. But his kingdom is not of the world. His kingdom is not from the world. Let me say it again. It is a relational and spiritual reign over the souls of his church that transcends every other little king and kingdom on the planet. Christ is king. Christ alone is king. Christ alone is the true and rightful king. The king of kings. The Lord of lords. And he alone brings with him the true kingdom of peace and of justice. We see that in Romans 5 verse 1. King Jesus makes peace between God 
man. You see that in Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through, insert political party here, nope, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 23 through 26. King Jesus brings justice for our sins. For there is no distinction for all that sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. He was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now the awesome promise of this kingdom is that anyone from any country, from any race, from any gender, from any culture can find their way into this kingdom. You, you, you don't have to stay in the line on Ellis Island to get in. You don't have to, to go through some kind of swearing in ceremony with the judge. You cannot cross the border illegally to get into this kingdom. You get into this kingdom, you enter in by turning from your sins and trusting in the all-sufficient finished work of Jesus Christ for you. If you're not a Christian, that's all you need to do to become a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's your passport. Faith and repentance. You have faith and repentance. You're in the new, in the new kingdom. You're a citizen. And all of us who are citizens now participate in God's expansion of his rule and reign both throughout the earth for his glory until Christ returns. See, this kingdom is already here, but it's not yet been fully established in its totality. It's a, it's a growing kingdom. It's spreading out all over the earth as the gospel goes forward. We see that in Matthew 13, 31. And Jesus tells a parable and he says, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his fields. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. So the gospel is going forward, and when Jesus comes back, this present evil age that we're in now will be done away with forever, and Christ, who will come and judge the living and the dead, will fully establish his reign as Lord over all, because Christ is King. Now, I am hammering this point to begin with, because this is the biblical vision of the gospel. This is how the gospel shapes our vision for the future. This is how the gospel shapes the vision of what even the end times looks like. Christ returns. Christ is king. If you're a citizen in his kingdom, you're with him forever. And so without a doubt, this is the central concern of the Bible. This is the central message of Jesus and the apostles. They are not launching political campaigns. They're not organizing freedom rallies. They are preaching Christ and him crucified. You look at the very end of the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church, and specifically Paul, the apostle, who's, who's the main character of the book of Acts. We see at the very end of Acts, we see the ending. This is what he's doing as his life ends. Acts 28, 30 and 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. I'm trying to establish in your mind and in your heart that the overwhelming emphasis in the scriptures is on seeking the advancement of the kingdom of heaven until Jesus returns and brings the fullness of his kingly presence to bear. And so Christians should not put their ultimate, keyword there, ultimate hope for peace, justice, and tranquility in the little kingdoms of this world, in the little progress of this world, in the little peace that this world offers, not in the restoration of this world, but in the already kingdom that is yet to fully come. That's where our ultimate hope is found. Let me say it a different way. We don't worship our presidents. Our Messiah will never be Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Joe Jurgensen or whoever else is on the, the ballot. It's Jesus. And J.D. Greer said this, he said, We are not of the tribe of the donkey or the tribe of the elephant. We are of the tribe of the lamb. Because Christ is king. And that is where our unity is found. Real unity, not fake unity. Real unity 
in the blood of the Lamb who was slain for us. And so you have to see this. You have to see this and believe this in order for your understanding of American politics to begin to make, make sense. Now, I have intentionally leaned the boat over to one side. You know how everybody's on the boat, and they all go to one side, the boat jumps the tip, right? I've intentionally leaned us over on one side so that you can feel the, the, the supremacy of this point, that Christ is king. Now, we're these citizens. I want us to feel that point intentionally because it's the most important point. But if we stay there, you just stay on the boat, you know, we're going to capsize at some point. If you stay there, we're going to miss other important truths that shouldn't be missed, like this. To say that Christ is our ultimate authority doesn't mean that we're not still on earth either. Or to say that the preaching of the gospel of Christ's kingdom is our central mission doesn't mean that there aren't other aspects to our lives outside of preaching. Or to say that our true citizenship is in heaven doesn't mean that our national citizenship is somehow revoked or invalidated. So just because something is most important doesn't make all the other things unimportant. So while the scriptures teach the priority of the evangelistic mission for Christians, it also speaks to the way that Christians should live under that earthly authority and how we should live in this culture for Christ. And so friends, if Christ is king, if he really is your king, he is the king, if he really is your king, he's king over the world, king over your life, it will shape the way you think about life, including the way that you think about politics. And so here's the five application points. If Christ is your king, you can participate in the political life of this country for the common good. So the Bible does not promote sort of a monasticism that we just pull ourselves out and just huddle up. No, we actually find the opposite. Galatians 6 10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. We can participate in political life for the common good. Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. Titus 3.10 says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. I think some may have forgotten that this is in the scriptures in 2020. But God himself works for the common good of people. Isn't that amazing? He, he lets the rain fall on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 5, 45. And so how can a Christian glorify God? A Christian can glorify God through helping to make their city, state, and country a better place to live. For the common good. And perhaps the most recognizable passage we find in the scriptures to this end is found in Jeremiah 29 which you're probably familiar with, maybe many of you are. So here's the backdrop to Jeremiah 29, before we read the passage. So in like sort of biblical history here, this is Israel has been conquered by the Babylonians, 586 BC, they've been conquered by the Babylonians, the temple has been destroyed, the people have been forced out of Jerusalem to go live in a pagan land of Babylon. They are strangers and aliens in this foreign place. Without the temple, how are they supposed to worship God? Without the land that God gave them, how are they know God's favor? And the prophet Jeremiah brings this word to the people from the Lord with the instructions on how they should go about their lives in Babylonian captivity. Here's what it says. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, Here's what you do. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. So do you notice two things here? He, doesn't, he tells them what to do. He doesn't say, stay on the boat. You know, just place yourselves off. I'll come rescue you in 70 years. No, he says, settle in, boys. It's going to be a while. You've got to build a house. You've got to, you've got to take a wife, plant a garden, move on with life in the meantime. 
And then he tells him to do it for this reason. He tells him to seek the good of the city. Verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city. It's where we get the word shalom from. It means peace, prosperity, security. So think about this. God wants his people to seek the peace of this pagan city. Isn't that kind of crazy? It's Babylon. This, this is the destroyer of God's people. He wants them to seek the peace of that. He wants Babylon to prosper. Why would God care? He's going to deliver them back in 70 years. I think God knows that. Why would he care? Because God is working for the common good, even in Babylon. And he calls his people to join him in this work. And it's so important to see this. Why? Why should they do this? Not to redeem the culture. Not to usher in the coming of the Messiah. Like, like the end times are going to come if we do this. Not to set the right conditions for Shalom to arrive. We see at the end of verse 7. It says, but seek the welfare of the city, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. He says, for their own good. As Babylon goes, so goes the people of God. If Babylon prospers, Israel prospers. If Babylon is attacked, Israel is attacked. And so God may spread the seeds of the gospel through the blood of the martyrs, but he's not legislating in that way. He wants them to seek the prosperity of the nation that they're in as exiles. Brothers and sisters, we are exiles in this country. We are aliens and strangers sojourning through this land, making our way to the heavenly kingdom. And only the gospel can bring true and lasting shalom. We cannot create a lasting peace on the outside unless it's made real first on the inside. But that doesn't mean that we can't seek the welfare of this city and of our state and of our country as we sojourn in heaven. This is where we find ourselves. 2020, October. Nothing working this morning. I'm praising God for this moment. This is where we are. So how can you, how can we as Christians then work for the shalom of the country? One of the great things about this country that isn't true of other countries that God so rules and reigns over is that God allows us to play a part in the process of our, of our government. He allows us to bring our, our laws and policies to pass through votes and through our voice, through the formal ballot and through the soapbox. Think about this. The Apostle Paul did not get the vote on whether Caesar should be in power. We get the opportunity to vote our leaders into office and to lobby for righteous laws for the sake of the common good. It is not a mandate. It is an opportunity. And so it leads us to the question, what will do the greatest good possible? Here's the second application. If Christ is your king, that you can listen and learn from differences with others while still enjoying the unity of the gospel as believers. I've been trying to say this in every which way for the last six months. Because the reality is we don't see things the same way, all of us. We're all on a, on a continuum, on, on various issues. You might be over here in one and over here in another. We're all different. And that's actually good. We're called to grow as Christians in our knowledge and wisdom. Maybe you need to grow. Maybe you're not thinking about it right. Maybe your fellow Christians can come alongside you, help you grow, help you think differently. Where we get into trouble is where we make assumptions about each other that shuts conversation down. And I'm challenging us as a church. Don't settle for judgment on each other. Don't assume conclusions. Sit and talk. Have a dialogue. It's okay. It's honestly okay to have a cup of coffee and to sit and talk with one another. Don't assume that someone who's voting for Trump is, has to be overlooking all of his character flaws. Don't assume that someone's voting for Biden that they are supporting abortion. Don't assume that someone's not voting that they're just throwing their vote away. Just because that's how you might think about it doesn't mean that's how everyone is thinking about it. I want us to take a moment and just think about the whole philosophy of voting as an example. Just to know a different way people think about it. But bear in mind, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about voting. Right? It doesn't tell us anything specifically about voting. So let's just think about the philosophy of voting for just a moment. So we can kind of see that there are many ways to come at this. If your philosophy of voting means wholeheartedly supporting the candidate that you vote for, character, conduct, policies, you, you might find it hard to vote for anyone. 
If your view of voting means choosing the best leader among two flawed options in a binary system, then you can vote for either candidate based on your assessment of which one you think is better. And every one of you has some general assessment of that, don't you? If your philosophy of voting means choosing the lesser of two evils, then you're going to vote for the candidate that's based on your assessment going to do the least amount of damage. If your philosophy of voting means standing up for one key issue, then you can vote for either candidate based on your assessment of what you think the most significant biblical issue is. If voting to you means standing against one policy that you despise, then you can vote for whichever candidate is most against that policy. If voting to you means supporting the platform and policies despite the flaws of the candidate, then you could vote for either candidate based on which platform you most align with in terms of key issues and overall framework despite tolerating disagreements in other areas for the sake of the common good. I hope you just see that there's lots of different ways to even come at what we're doing when we're voting. Came across this really helpful article by Kevin DeYoung who argues for more of a functional view of voting that I think has some good things to say in it. He says, it's important at the outset, I didn't have this on the screen because it's just too long. It's important at the outset to remember what we are voting for. In our American system, we will go to the polls in November and vote for many things. A president, a representative at the state and federal level, possibly a senator or governor, maybe a mayor or a drain commissioner. We'll probably vote on a number of proposals, referenda, tax increases. But we won't be voting for our next pastor or who we will have dinner with next Friday. We won't be voting on a confession of faith or a statement of Christology. We'll be voting for politicians and for political proposals. This is not to suggest that we must sequester politics from, quote, spiritual things and have no business bringing our faith into the voting booth. My point is simply that we must remember what we are doing and not doing on the first Tuesday in November. We aren't making a vow or binding our conscience to any person or position. We are not making a declaration that we love this candidate and agree with him or her from top to bottom. Rather, we are casting a vote for the common good. As strangers and aliens in this world, we approach every election day as an opportunity seeking the welfare of our earthly city. Hey, okay, that sounds familiar. So when we draw those straight lines or punch through those hanging chats, the young people who don't know what that we ought to have this question in mind. How can I, with my vote, best advance what I believe to be the proper role and goals of government. This choice will almost always require Christians to weigh bad against better and do without what is best. The cynics may snort their incredulity and apathetically disbelieve in the ability of politics to accomplish anything worthwhile, but as, as Clark Forsyth argues in politics for the greatest good, there is no moral compromise when we make the aim of politics not the perfect good, but the greatest good possible. I say this to point out that there is more than one perspective on what's even being accomplished when you vote. Now, you may have, and very likely do have, strong opinions about how you personally answer these questions in determining whether or not to vote at all and for whom. You, you might have a very clear sense of who you're going to vote for, but here's what I want us to understand. When voting in a particular way becomes a litmus test for the genuineness and sincerity of faith as a believer in Jesus Christ, Without understanding what is even motivating that person to vote, or driving that person to thinking, or understanding what the end goal is for the way that person is voting, you've crossed into a dangerous territory. We can sincerely ask questions, and we might find that people are more thoughtful than we think. Application number three. If Christ is king, if Christ is your king, you can love your Christian neighbor with whom you disagree. I put this in the spiritual category of charity. Because in the end, if you do application number two, and you listen and you learn from each other, you're still at the end of the day going to disagree with people, right? You can listen, you can learn, but at the end of the day, you will probably disagree with people, maybe even significantly. And here lies one of the great opportunities for us as Christians. Listen, please get this. We as Christians can declare that our love for each other is greater than our political opinions. Because we're all the tribe of the Lamb. We can demonstrate our love for each other. We're at the same kingdom, building the same, the same kingdom expansion. In a time and place where snarky rebuttals are a sign of strength, 
It is a sign of Christian immaturity if we let political opinions diminish our love for each other. That is what the world thinks. The world says, you fit into my grid, I'll love you, if not, cancel. Christians get to say, I may disagree with you and how you're thinking about this, but I'm not going to stop loving you. Because I'm, our love is greater than our political opinions. I'm not going to break fellowship with you over it. It's called Christian charity. I think, it's, I think it's ironic that if Jesus calls us to love our enemies, then we can love our fellow Christians who we disagree with. If we're called to love our enemies, we surely can love our fellow Christians. One of the one of the things that we've got for you today that is working because it's hard copy, no technology involved, is uh, a book called How Can I Love Church Members with Different Politics? It's a nine marks book. It's obviously very short. Jonathan Lehman, Amy Masali. Uh, it's going to be out on display for you out there on the table as you leave. You can pick up a copy of it, one per family. Uh, and it's a short read that will help you apply what we're talking about here. If Christ is your king, you can love your Christian neighbor with whom you disagree. Fourth, if Christ is your king, you can keep on trusting God no matter who is elected. I put this in the category of faith. Because God is still on the throne, is he not? God is still on the throne. Listen, there's not a single vote passed that's going to change that. And no matter who gets voted in on November 3rd, we're still going to need to trust God on November 4th. So we, we shouldn't act as if like, the whole history of the world is coming to a close on, on that Tuesday. Plus, it's probably going to be this week until that kind of stuff. So, a few months before we get to the end. But even still, we still have to trust God, right? Listen, I was so challenged by this quote. I, I love our country. I love our country. I want the common good for our country. But listen to this quote as a, as a Christian. Think biblically. David Platt recently said, I'm not advocating this is where we go, by the way. But, but even if we lose every freedom and protection we have as followers of Jesus in the United States, which, by the way, will mirror some other countries that are under God's reign right now, and even if our government were to become a completely totalitarian regime, we could still live in abundant life. The life of Jesus, the treasury of Jesus. We could still live an abundant life as long as we didn't look to political leaders, platforms, or policies for our ultimate satisfaction. We still trust in our, our king. And as citizens of a heavenly kingdom that cannot be shaken, with a king who cannot be toppled, we have nothing really ultimately to fear, no matter who gets elected to run this nation. Amen. Fifth and last, if Christ is your king, your greatest zeal is reserved for what is of the greatest importance. And I would just say, let your greatest zeal be reserved for what is of the greatest importance. You know, politics reveals who or what we're truly worshiping. Who or what we're truly worshiping. And with the gospel of the kingdom in view, you can hold politics in its proper place and significance. It's important. It matters. But it's not ultimate. Let's be most passionate about what is most ultimate, what's most important. Listen, ask yourself this question. Would your last 10 social media posts convey what is most important? Would your last 10 social media posts convey what you are against or what you're for? We have, we have more, listen, we have more, we have more in common with, gen, with genuine believers in Somalia than we do with non-believing Americans of our same political persuasion. So as we go into this last month, no matter who wins the earthly kingdom election, let's tell the right story. Let's tell the story, the true story, the story of Christ as King, the one who can be trusted. We are his citizens by grace, and by grace alone, we are unified in his blood, and we are working for the common good, and God's using his church to promote his glory on this earth. Hallelujah. We can trust in this kingdom. Let's pray together. God, bind us together in the cause of Christ for the sake of your name. Bind us together 
in Christ for the sake of your name. Lord, cause our hearts to repent. If we've been convicted of being about anything more ultimate than you, and we've placed politics or platforms or candidates or outcomes on the throne where you belong, you are reigning and ruling even right now, and around your throne is a sea of, of glass, like, like crystal. But Lord, we know you are the peace, true justice, tranquility, shalom. We pray and come, Lord, and reign here on this earth. And Lord, we do ask for wisdom as your people to, to walk in ways that please you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.